Ahead of the Money Week Summit on the 29th of September, we wanted to bring you a series of interviews with some of our favourite fund managers, both those who will be attending the summit and those who aren't. In this interview, I sat down with Sue Nofke, Head of UK Equities at Schroders, to discuss the current situation in the UK market and opportunities for income as well as growth investors. I hope you enjoy the interview, and if you've not already, you can buy tickets for the Money Week Summit at www.moneyweeksummit.com. Well, welcome, Sue. Thank you for joining us. Delighted to be here. UK equities, uh, they are hated the world over, perhaps, you could put it that way. What are your views? I think the silver lining <laughs> in being the mill wall uh, of global stock markets is no one likes us and we don't care. It's really that there's a plethora of valuation opportunities right the way across the, the market, which is fantastic for me as a stock picker, but it's also really interesting for people thinking about investing for the first time or adding money to their investment portfolios because valuation starting points are a real driver of future returns. So the fact that valuations are low gives you quite a good starting point for eventual returns. What about risks, though? Because obviously, a lower valuation does discount some risk. But what are the major risks, really, here for UK investors? So domestic retail investors and international investors definitely see risks to the UK economy. They see risks from politics, still a lot of overhang of Brexit, a lot of upheaval around a change of government, a slowing of the UK economy. So there was much um, debate and fear that we were going to slip into recession um, after last autumn's mini budget and that pushed up bond yields. And we've seen the tightening in bank rates. The fact that we haven't had a recession, we've actually had better economic growth, has not taken recession risk off the table. In fact, people are still fearful uh, of that into the future. So these are the, the main risks. There's also currency risk. So we saw sterling fall very sharply in the autumn of 2022, and it's recovered quite nicely in 2023. But that level of volatility has created residual fear factors. Mm -hmm. Then we've got interest rates. And a lot of people, whether they're with a mortgage, without a mortgage, haven't seen interest rates this high for a long time. And the speed at which interest rates have moved is likely to come with some problems. So waiting to see how that transpires. The rise in interest rates, though, has been a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what's different about the UK? I think the angst is around the stock market and the lack of exposure to technology. We've seen technology fly, mm -hmm. especially in the United States. And people look at where's the UK's Apple well, maybe that was on, but that's gone to float in the US. There's been a lot of thinking and a lot of talking about what initiatives can policymakers do. And over the spring and summer, we've seen a lot of um, ideas come out, and much of those have been part to the autumn statement to be enacted. But for example, some of the ideas that could take place are for pension pots of money to be allocated to different areas of the market. So a little bit more risk taking. By taking risk, you would hope to get return. That, that's the way investing's worked. And moving down the, the market cap spectrum to some um, smaller companies, for example, to, to invest more money into those. They typically are faster growing. Some of those might be in the biosciences area or the fintech area, which the UK economy plays to pretty well. And that, that could be a, a spur for investment in the UK. I think 
more kind of realistically and nearer term, what, what could be a catalyst to get people looking back uh, at UK equities? They know they're cheap, but, but what could give them confidence to put some money to work? would be a settling down of bond yields. Now, the rise in bond yields has been a global phenomenon, but the UK has been at the sharp end of that. So there's been much more volatility to the upside. And we did see some extreme moves both last autumn and also in June when inflation printed quite hot in the UK and people moved their expectations of interest rate peaks to 6.5%. Now, that seems quite high and since then we've seen a little bit of cooling in the employment market and in um, leading indicators called purchasing managers indices. So actually we've moved to bad news is good news for, for markets because softer economic data means that we don't have to go as high on interest rates and that means that the pain is going to be more short-lived rather than pretty messy. Mm -hmm. and I think that brings me quite nicely into one of the stocks I think you quite like is Pets at Home which I think it plays into these themes that everything is not doing well, certain sectors are doing well, certain sectors are going to continue to do better than others because you've got people who have bought all these pets in Covid and they're willing to spend on them and at the same time we are seeing some wage growth so they're willing to spend more on their cat rather than at Waitrose for example. So I'd be curious if you could just speak a little bit about what you like about that company and where you see it going, its longevity and how it plays into the whole economic environment today. Fantastic set of questions for a, for a fantastic company. You know, I, I'm a pet owner, I've got two cats and, and one dog. None of them were pandemic purchases, but I'm aware of how much they, they cost, not just the pet food and the, the toys and accessories, but the insurance and the grooming, because I've got a cockapoo. Um, but this is a global phenomenon um, in terms of, of pet ownership. Um, they, they are child substitutes for, for some people, both at the younger generation end and the older generation, the empty nesters. Um, what's also happened is that the working from home phenomenon has encouraged more people to be able to, to have a pet, mm -hmm. whereas five days in the office before were, was quite constraining. Pets on average live quite a long time uh, and they require more intervention the older they get. Mm -hmm. So you need infant nutrition effectively for, for young pets, but you need more specialist care uh, as they age. There's also um, personification um, of pets. So pe people like to, to treat them. There's premiumization of, of pet food, mm -hmm. etc. So lots of spending opportunities. Uh, and that's why we think pets is a, a great market segment compared to, to say, standard food or, or standard apparel. So there's the market growth. Then there's a question of what is the company doing in, in terms of, of making profits, investing in the future, digitizing, and really delivering a personal service. So you can get discounts, you can get offers, they can deliver directly to you, whether it's pick up in, in store or direct to your, your home. They know when your, your flea and worming treatment is required. And this is all investment in service and differentiating. Is that also AI, sort of AI and technology combining to provide the perfect retail experience? It, it is. You know, what, what was um, leading edge in retail five or ten years ago has moved on leaps and bounds, and that's all to do with data and data mining. It's interesting that at Pets at Home they've got a new chief executive who comes from a media background. So she was at Sky and she brings many of these digital skills with her to apply to the retail environment. And in terms of retail in general, uh, what's your view on retailers that haven't got that edge? And you think many are going to struggle? Well, we, we've seen many go out of, of business. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing capitalism, Darwinism uh, at work. And both the cost of living crisis, rental growth, um, putting 
cost pressures onto retailers after the pandemic has really meant that the weak have fallen by the wayside. That has a silver lining in it, in that the strong can pick up that market share. So what we've seen actually is the likes of Marks and Spencers and Next in the apparel um, side of retail gain market share as weaker competitors ha have exited. We've seen that I in leisure sectors as well with Whitbread against the independents. And this is a good thing. Um, so you consolidate market positions in tough times and you go on to invest for the future for better times. It's interesting you mentioned Marks and Spencers there because I think that has to be one of the great recovery stories of, of well, 2023, that this company that many people had written off effectively has been able to, I think it's one of the top performing companies on the market, which is, uh, I, I'm not sure if you own it or anything or you have a view on it, but it's really, really fascinating to see that play out. And is, uh, like, is this the premiumization trend? Is it, it's capturing market share? I think it's a really interesting phenomenon. So Marks & Spencer's has suffered for about 20 years. Mm. I haven't been invested in it. It's got an executive chairman, Archie Norman, who's got a fantastic retail pedigree. And I think many of the, the changes that they've put in place around the structure have helped. The demise of peer competitors has really helped. And if you think about the demographics of Marks & Spencer's customer base, they tend to be more affluent older people. They're spending on premium food, they might be trading down from eating out, but they're, they're still buying the meal deals from M&S, and it's the value for money equation. Then the the apparel franchise has been reinvigorated. So again, they've had newer talent go into the, the stores and simplify and provide a good value for money offer. And that's resonating with customers. So back to pets um, again, they, I think you own that as an income and a growth play. Indeed. Could you talk about why you like it as an income play as well as a growth opportunity? Well, I'm into buying companies when their shares are mispriced. So we could see all the attractions that I've talked about in terms of the structural growth opportunities of the market. But there was a fear factor in 2018, 2019, when I first bought this. And that meant that the shares were yielding between 5 and 6% which is pretty attractive for something that's got growth characteristics. So I felt that I could be paid to wait in the income side for that growth to manifest because the company was investing in its future, particularly around the vet practices, which were more capital intensive, to provide loans to the, the vets to start up and grow those businesses within the store franchise. And that's played out really well. I didn't anticipate the pandemic supercharging pet ownership, but we could see many of the trends that were evident both in the UK uh, market, but internationally as well. Now, I'd, I'd like to explore this theme more. I think a lot of people, when they look at income stocks, they go for the big, the ones of five or six or 7% dividend yields and say, I like those. But this whole theme of finding a, finding a income stock such as Burberry, which I believe you like, that might not have the highest yield on the market, but has potential to grow that income and grow its earnings, and then you generate return from both income and capital. I'm just like, uh, curious about your thoughts about that approach and how you, how you view that approach, really. You make a really good point, because a bit like with markets, things are cheap for a reason, there, there are risks, going back to your initial questions. And the same is true for stocks. So a high dividend yield requires lots of scrutiny as to how sustainable do we think that is. So that's where we do a lot of screening work, a lot of sensitivity to, to really check what would break the company, what would cause a cut in dividend. Because you wouldn't expect those high yielding companies to grow very much. But when you're putting together a, an investment portfolio, it's really important to think about the characteristics. Is it a higher risk, high yield portfolio that, that just tries to cover off 
one aspect or is it a, a blended? I take a blended approach, so I want to have growth there as well. And that means looking for stocks that are not higher yielding today, but will grow their dividends over time. Keep pace with inflation. Inflation has been hot uh, on everyone's lips in the last 18 months. But before that, people had kind of ignored the, the risks of inflation. And inflation is a real risk to people's wealth. Uh, and the, their savings ability. So to be able to compound growth in dividends ahead of inflation, that really protects your wealth, both in terms of the income stream, but also your, your capital as well. So that's what I'm looking for. It is, sometimes we call it a, a barbell approach, but it's a blended approach where we, we don't just go for the high risk, high yielders. We go for some interesting companies that are able to reward shareholders with dividend growth that can expand and grow and invest in their businesses. And Burberry is one of those. Luxury goods, a bit like pet care, has structural growth drivers. But Burberry is much cheaper than many of its European luxury names. It's less um, scaled, but it has the same gross margins, just not the same operating margins. So it needs to grow a bit more or become more efficient. Now, it's had quite a lot of changes in management. We think those are good at bringing new eyes, new ideas to, to the business. And it's got a very strong balance sheet. So it can afford to invest in its business and it can afford to both pay a dividend to shareholders as well as do a share buyback. That's very accretive and very attractive for quite a unique asset. It's a heritage brand. You know, I think it's always going to be here. Whether it's always going to be an independent company is, is something that we also ask ourselves. Uh, just jump back to income versus growth there for a second. Do you think people often spend too much time focusing on the income side of the equation rather than the income growth? I think you're probably right in your assessment. You know, <laughs> pe people are, are very short-termists, so they, they think, what do I get today rather than what am I going to get over the next five years, over the next 10 years? Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that's quite natural, isn't it? You know, we've, yeah. we've got more certainty today. And if you think you see a 5% yield, maybe you're, you're thinking of investing in, in bonds or in a cash account, a, a cash ISA, or tying your money up for, for six months. But how are you going to feel in five years' time, when you just get that back, not, not anything bigger. So trying to get people to think longer term about what, what are the real financial objectives? Where do they want to be? How, how much do they need to support their lifestyle ambitions or whatever responsibilities they're going to have I into the future? World leaders. The UK market has some great world leading companies. I mean, is that, are investors missing this? I mean, do you, in your opinion, is this just a steal? I, some I think, of these valuations. I think it is. But, but when, when people will wake up uh, and realize that, it, it's a question I, I don't know the answer. So the answer is to hold on to these great companies and just pocket those dividends and wait for the growth. That, that's right, to be patient. Yeah. Uh, and if you wait for the identifiable catalyst, the chances are you'll be looking at the rear view mirror and thinking you've missed out. You, you can never anticipate that two, two thirds of returns from UK equities have come from dividends and dividend growth uh, and the rest is your starting valuation. We, we know that UK equities have a fantastically cheap valuation. We know that they have a premium um, yield from, from dividends. They've typically grown quite well. And at the moment, the people who are buying UK equities are the companies themselves. So if we think in round numbers, the dividend base of the UK equity market is about 100 billion. Share buybacks last year were 50. So say the, the UK equity market yielded four and share buybacks is another 2% on, on top of that. That's a 6% yield to shareholders, you are really being paid to wait and you will get growth over the medium to longer term.